visible now? Yeah. Good. Uh, hey everyone. Uh, so this session, uh, in this session, we are focusing on broadly two areas, uh, both uh, related to Defender for Office 365. So for the first half of the session, we will be focusing on uh, secure posture, the importance of it, and how to how can different tools in MDO help you maintain that optimal configuration and uh, secure posture, followed by a session on how to get the most out of phishing simulation and training, which is part of Defender for Office 365. So today we have four people with us. So my name is Nitin. So I will start the presentation by focusing on the first half, which is uh, related to configuration. Uh, and then later my colleagues, uh, Richa, Vipul, and Daniel will uh, assist uh, in covering the phishing simulation and training uh, related content. So all of all of us are product managers working in Defender for Office 365. And yeah, here to help you get more sort of this talk. All right, uh, so let's dig in. So the agenda is, uh, so we will focus on two concepts in, in, in the config area. One is secure by default and maintaining secure posture. So let's start with secure posture, right? And why it's important and how can you actually maintain secure posture in this day and age? So why is secure posture important? Uh, so it's not enough, uh, you know, as a SOC team uh, to buy a security product and deploy it, right? Because no security product is foolproof. It's equally important uh, for the security team or IT team to properly configure uh, different policies, make sure that everyone in the organization has that attitude towards securing their organization's resources. For example, a simple setting like multi-factor authentication has found to have blocked 99.9% .9 of compromise attacks. So even though you have strong security solutions like identity, etc., just by enabling the simple control as an admin, uh, you know, you could have uh, made your organization much more secure. So that's the kind of power of having a good, strong uh, configuration policies. And also uh, the sophistication of attacks in this day and age has becoming more and more complex. Most of you might have been aware about solar winds attack, uh, the supply chain attack, which is a, a really complicated attack. And we have been seeing uh, usage of LLMs uh, to create uh, sophisticated campaigns that mirrors a human. So it's in this day of in this day and age, it's important to you know honor the zero trust philosophy, wherein you do not trust anyone to be a good actor because anyone can be compromised by an attacker at any time. So it's important to have uh, that zero trust, uh, that zero trust thinking in whenever you build your systems and deploy. Now, maintaining this secure posture is also difficult because you know, especially in the exchange world, there are a lot of legacy settings. Different admins come and leave the organization. You do you are uh, hesitant to touch those legacy config because you worry what will happen if I remove something. There is, there's also a ton of new features that, that we ship in the product, new controls, uh, new attack scenarios that you need to be on top of. And this can at times, at times be challenging. So this is why uh, in Defender for Office 365, we, we have two broad areas of solutions, right? One is we want to make sure that our product is secure by default. By that, I mean, even if the admin doesn't take any action other than just purchasing the product, you already get a very strong, solid default secure security out of the box. You don't need to really understand or configure anything. So that you know, you start with strong defaults, and then people who want to customize can customize. And the second area is about in case you do customize, how can we surface within the product uh, our recommendations of uh, different policy configuration, recommending against bad configurations, and also have some easy way for you to stay on top of recommended settings, uh, you know, forever. So I'm gonna uh, dive deep into these two areas now. 
So starting with the first bucket, which is making sure that the product is secure out of the box, right? So MDO built-in protection is something that we shipped almost, uh, it's been almost more than a year. Uh, so with this built-in protection, what it does is it's going to enable some key, key critical security settings for each and every mailbox in the organization, as long as they have a uh, paid uh, MDO license. So this policy is going to enable safe links, safe attachments, safe links for teams, uh, very essential, even including time of click protect, uh, protection, which is essential uh, for you to prevent phishing attacks in your organization. So let's say you purchased MDO and haven't configured a safe link, safe attachment policy. The built-in protection will still cover uh, the protection for everyone, every user in the organization. So with this, we have elevated the ba base security level of everyone by default, just out of the box. The other uh, thing that we have done to make sure that the defaults are, sh are strong is eliminating high confidence fish overrides. So what is an override? So whenever you encounter a false positive, for example, uh, you get an email uh, from a, a partner organization that you're working with and it goes to spam or it goes to quarantine. As an end user, I mean, I will be pissed. I want emails from that person to deliver to my inbox because if it goes to spam, I will discover it a few days later and uh, that the person who sent the email might think that I'm uh, not responsive, etc. So as an end user, I will complain to my admin and the admin sometimes will be in a position where they just have to go and add that sender or domain to an allow list. So we call that an override because essentially, even if our filters have detected that email as bad, since you have configured an allow, we will override our verdict and still deliver the email to inbox. Uh, while it, it has its use, over the years, we have seen that these allows, uh, when people add it, they they keep the, they keep it in that list forever and the list gets piled up over the years and what happens is an attacker if they compromise even one domain amongst them they can launch a massive phishing attack that can threaten your entire organization and we have seen uh, based on some data studies that it is indeed impacting a lot of our customers so we made a decision as a product uh, that if we detect a particular incoming email as a high confidence fish, by high confidence fish, we mean we have enough uh, evidence of something being malicious in that email. In that case, even if there is an allow, we will not honor that and still deliver that email to quarantine. Uh, and we do this for both malware as well as high confidence fish. So when I say allows, it includes exchange transport rule based ACL minus one allows anti-spam allows, end-user outlook safe sender, uh, block sender allows, and then the IP allows in the IP policy. Uh, so if we broadly look at the scenarios why an admin or a user want to put an allow, right? We have broadly four buckets. So here, as you can see, the left two buckets are legitimate scenarios. So one is phishing simulation. In phishing simulation, you will uh, send a mail which looks like a phishing email uh, because it's an educational email. So uh, our filters will obviously detect it as bad, but we do not want to block it, right? Because it's for training purposes. So we need to actually override our filters in that uh, scenario, which is a legitimate scenario. The second one is SecOps mailbox. So this is more of a monitoring mailbox that is typically used by the SecOps team uh, to route uh, all those phishing and malware messages to a centralized mailbox for them to do further digging. So even in this case, we want the email to deliver unfiltered. So these are two legitimate scenarios wherein we want to allow those overrides. And that's the reason we have created a new advanced delivery policy uh, in the threat policy section, wherein you can configure the specific IP sender, which sends that phishing simulation emails, as well as the specific recipient SecOps mailboxes uh, that we will uh, honor the allows and send the emails unfiltered. And then uh, the third bucket is third party filters. So, uh, so this secure by default is by the way for EOP as well as MDO. So we understand that some customers uh, who are just using the EOP solution 
might want to use a, a certain third party email security solution as well. Uh, so in that case, we we want to give them a choice to uh, use that particular solution without our solution interfering it. So that's the reason uh, this particular secure by default is only enabled if your MX record is pointed to Office 365. So let's say your MX is pointed to some other third party. Uh, we will not enforce this and you can uh, use your alerts. Uh, the last bucket is uh, an actual use case. You know, you know, at the end of the day, even if we do all this, you will get some false positives. You will have some good emails ending up in spam or quarantine, and that's a problem. Uh, so we have a, a new page called Tenant Allow Blocklist, which so the way we designed that, unlike the other allows in anti-spam, is that these allows are per filter. So you have allows for spoof separately. You have allows uh, specifically for URLs, senders, domains. Uh, so and we also encourage you to perform submissions whenever there is a false positive. And in that flow, you can also add an allow. And we made sure that those allows have some expiry, but some default expiry to them, which you can adjust so that those allows don't stay for multiple years, right? Because uh, after some time, our filters will learn that it's a good email and uh, not still flag it as bad. So there's no point in keeping those allows and exposing yourself for a significant amount of time. So using that is you know, much more secure compared to these legacy allows. So that's how you can manage uh, your false positives, if any. So now uh, let's switch gears to the second area, which is, OK, you have the strong defaults, but a lot of customers want to customize according to their own uh, requirements, uh, their appetite for false positives, et cetera. Now, in that case, uh, what are some of the ways that you can, what are some of the tools in the product that you can use to, to still maintain that secure posture, right? So the first one is the preset security policies. So in the preset tab, the same tab with the built-in protection policy is there, you can see two preset policies. One is standard and one is strict. So the whole uh, philosophy or concept behind a preset policy is these are the policies which will always stay up to date with Microsoft recommended security settings. So this cannot be edited. Uh, there's just a toggle to switch on or off, and you can assign it to a set of, set of individuals. And behind the scenes, as and when we add new settings or we have a different opinion about an importance of the setting, Microsoft will always keep these policies up to date with Microsoft recommended security settings. So in case you are an admin uh, that, that is understaffed, you do not have a big soft team, uh, you have to deal with a lot of other things and uh, don't have time to be constantly keep updating this, and you just want to take whatever Microsoft fragments, this is a great way because all you have to do is switch a toggle and expect that you would not end up in a stage where there are misconfigurations. Uh, we know that this is not for everyone. Uh, some people really want that control over customization, but in case you want to make things simple, this is really a great way. Uh, so, uh, so standard is is like the common uh, recommendation that we recommend. Strict is for customers who want to be a little bit more aggressive uh, in catching emails. That means they are okay with slightly uh, more false positives, but they really want uh, most of the bad emails to be caught. So some customers actually do uh, use both. They use standard for everyone and strict, especially for you know executives or someone who has access to sensitive data like HR, uh, et cetera. So even that is something that uh, the customers do use. Another uh, very popular tool uh, this used to be an out of the product tool uh, that you know uh, our team has released in GitHub, but we have in, since then incorporated that within the product. It's called config configuration analyzer. So in here, what it's what it does is it looks at all your custom policies, it compares it against our standard recommendations, and flag any settings which deviate from them, and you can click one of them 
uh, there is a button called apply recommendation. Uh, within one click, you can just update uh, your what your setting to the recommended one. We are adding some more improvements to this, uh, wherein if you click on a recommendation, it's going to actually show why we are recommending that setting. Why is it important with uh, a link to that documentation with more details? Uh, we are also adding more recommendations. Uh, there's also a configuration drift tab uh, towards the right, which will show uh, which user has, which admin has actually modified uh, this particular setting at which point in time so that, you know, uh, sometimes people do make changes for a reason and uh, it, it's a good tool to understand who made that change so that, you know, you talk about why we made that change and whether it makes sense or not. So, yeah, so overall to summarize, so we have taken a stance that the default should be stronger, even if it might cause a minor inconvenience. And we added a bunch of tools in the product to make it easy uh, to stay on top of good config. Uh, even, even if we add more features and more settings, uh, new kinds of attacks, et cetera, make it easy to be on top of them. So finally, one last topic that uh, I wanted to address is around mail flow setup. Uh, I think there was another session uh, earlier in the day titled Defense in Depth. Uh, which talked about this in more detail. So I would encourage, uh, in case if you haven't attended the talk to uh, look at that recording, uh, but here I will just give a high level glimpse. So today, a lot of customers, even though they have MDO or EOP, they would still want to use another third party as, as a defense in depth strategy, because you know whatever MDO might miss, some other third, third party might catch is there. Uh, at least their hypothesis, right? And 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 that's a valid uh, scenario to have. So when you when customers use a third party product, you know you you need to set up your mail flow, right? Uh, where does it end up? Where does it flow? How does it travel, etc. And we see two popular ways uh, where customers are two popular uh, mail flow setups. The first one is MX record is pointed to a third party gateway. And then the third party has a connector to EOP. Uh, so the email first goes to the third party and it then subsequently sends the email to EOP. So here, the important thing to keep in mind is, as you can look at the uh, diagram on the right, if the, let's say there's an incoming email and that original sender IP is 192.168.1.15, it ends up at the third party because MX is pointed to third party. And the IP of that server is something else, 172.17.17. Now, once they route that email to EOP, what our filters will see as the IP is not the original IP, but the IP of the third party. So since this is an incorrect data, our filters might misbehave. Our filters might fail authentication. Our machine learning models might give an incorrect verdict and cause a whole bunch of false positives. So to avoid this, we already have a feature in the product uh, since a long time called enhanced delivery for connectors. So that is a requirement. Uh, so in that, in uh, in there, you can actually say that, hey, this is an intermediate IP that I want to skip. So you can create, uh, you can tell the policy that, hey, skip this 172.17.17 IP address and take the previous IP address as the original IP address. So once you set up, then EOP will have all the required data and will, fun will function as expected. So that's one point. The second scenario is slightly more complex, but we are seeing uh, more and more customers using it. It's technically an unsupported uh, mail flow setup from our point of view, uh, but we are uh, uh, working on uh, fixing it and supporting this. Uh, so in this scenario, right, may MX record is pointed to EOP. But then uh, they route that email from EOP to a third party or an on-prem server, and then route it again uh, back to EOP. So same as the previous scenario, right? So when the email comes back to EOP the second time, it doesn't have the uh, full information there. So the filters will again continue to misbehave and cause a bunch of false positives. And we see customers 
are uh, raising tickets with us as <laughs> what's happening. But uh, this is currently not supported. Uh, customers are free to use it, but uh, there are some consequences to it. However, uh, we are working on some improvements uh, to it. One other pitfall that uh, I would highlight in this scenario is that so when the email comes to EOP the first time, EOP will come up with some verdict for that email, right? The verdict could be spam, malware, or fish, regular fish, or high confidence fish. Now, depending on what action you have set for different verdicts, in case of high confidence fish, it will it will quarantine the message. It won't go to the uh, third party, so that is fine. But in case we mark it as spam or regular fish, wherein the policy action is to junk, send the email to junk. And that action is really executed on the mailbox, right? If once it receives to the mailbox, then we will send it to the spam folder. Uh, but since the connector uh, will execute before, even, even though we have detected that email as spam, it will go to the third party server uh, and then the third party might claim it as spam, fish, whatever, and quarantine on their side. And their reporting will claim that as, hey, MDO has missed this email and we have caught it, see how better we are. It's now, uh, not all of them might be doing this, but this is something to keep in mind uh, because uh, you, you can leverage the reporting on the MDO side to get a pitch, better picture of what is the verdict that we are giving to that email. Just because the email uh, is goes to the third party, that, that, that doesn't mean MDO has marked it as a good mail. It, it could have marked it as a spam or regular fish, depending on what action uh, you're configuring the policy. So just something to remember uh, in case you're testing these uh, third party email gateways uh, so that you can make an informed decision. Uh, there are a whole bunch of resources. Uh, that there's a lot of documentation uh, in this area, a lot of guides that we have written. Uh, there is a difference in depth section which specifically goes into this. So I would strongly encourage to leverage this. Uh, they are all linked in these slides. Uh, with that, uh, I will hand over to Whipple, uh, who will kickstart with our next area of. Thank you so much, Nitin. Uh, I'll just start sharing my screen, everyone. Let me know. Uh, Richard or Daniel, one of you could confirm if the screen is visible. Yes, it's all good. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Nitin, for that great session on uh, secure portion uh, configuration of policies. Uh, so in this session, we are going to talk about uh, simulation and training. We are going to look at some of the recommended approaches on why simulation and training is important. Uh, we are going to look at a couple of case studies around how some of the enterprises we work with run their simulation programs. And finally, we are going to take you through how attack simulation and training can help you some of the recommended objectives around planning a simulation program. So uh, Nit uh, Nitin had earlier flashed this slide in which we talked about how Office 365 is basically a, a six prong strategy around configuration, SOC experiences, and remediation. And an equally important pillar is around simulation and training. The idea being that you would like to fortify defenses uh, pertaining to your end user so that they can be your last and consolidated point of defense. When we uh, look at some of the statistics and some of the uh, metrics around simulation, around phishing attacks, around breach, is around social engineering, uh, we often find that human error and phishing threats are amongst the top two or three categories of attacks which lead to overall breaches. In fact, a bulk of phishing attacks typically begin with some level of social engineering or some level of human compromise. And when we look about, and when we talk to a lot of organizations who focus on how to uh, address or combat. Yeah. Ripple, sorry for interrupt. Uh, your your sharing is um, not really stable. It's uh, blinking. Can you can you try to reshare again? Okay, let me go ahead and try to reshare. Let me go ahead and share it again. Can you see my slide on uh, securing your digital estate? Not yet. 
No, yeah. But what we can do, we can take over the sharing. This is weird because it's showing up for me. Uh, Aniket, can you confirm if you can see the slide on securing a digital estate? Yeah, now it is stable. Before it was like flickering. Okay, it's let me go through. Flickering for me. Oh. Okay, um, Richard, can you take over the sharing in that case? Yeah, and see if it is second. stable. Thank you. Um, Just a reminder, we have me, yeah. 15 more minutes. We need to speed up. Could things. you try again? Oh, sorry, it's flickering for me. So sorry. I think uh, Nitin's sharing has stuck. Yeah. Nitin, can you hear us? That's why I think it is causing an issue. Uh, I Yeah, I can hear you. Let Nitin, me, let me you exit the... from the meeting. Yeah, let me exit. Yeah, okay. Even the, the okay, let me try sharing once again. Uh, Richard, can you please confirm? You can see the screen yeah, and if yeah. it is still shaking. Yeah, it's better now. It's better okay. now. Awesome. Wow. Uh, so uh, I was talking about how social engineering attacks are most important, uh, critical category of attacks that lead to breaches. And organizations often, when they think about securing the digital estate, they pivot a lot on processes and technology, but forget to index a lot on people, which is an equally important focus area for configuring or securing a digital estate. In fact, when we look at some of the measurements around metrics around uh, training, for example, a good category of training can go ahead and reduce the fish susceptibility for an organization, organization by almost 40%, which is a massive level of impact for a medium category of investment. So when we think about the behavior change and how we can uh, influence the end user, it's often a combination of three things. There is critically focus on the culture of an organization. You need to have a supportive culture which can focus a lot on uh, positive attributes around learning and evolving versus penalizing and uh, putting the employee in the spotlight. There should be a right level of focus on motivation, both intrinsic motivation as an employee, as well as extrinsic motivation provided by the organization as part of supportive culture. And finally, uh, the program, we need to have an awareness and education program connected to the notions of supportive culture and motivation so that it can drive continuous evolving and permanent behavior change in a positive direction. And when we think about this whole uh, compendium around awareness, education and supportive culture and motivation, there is no uh, single person or single POC who should be responsible, right? It takes a village to drive that organization resilience. And that is why a successful cyber training program is a collaboration, is a partnership across multiple stakeholders driven by executive leadership, but also involving SOC teams, learning or development organizations, human resources, in some cases, even legal organizations and so on. So it truly takes a village to drive and improve the organization resilience. So when you think about how do, what is the optimal strategy around configuring a right awareness and training program for my organizations? How do I think about it? How do I plan for it? Uh, you should always begin with the basics, which is I should assess the current state. Where are we right now? Maybe you don't run a simulation program. Maybe you have something which is, let's say run once a year or maybe once a month, whatever the frequency, but you should always make sure you are benchmarking the current state of your program and monitoring it on a regular basis, as well as what is your organization susceptibility. Then you should go ahead and define the program objectives and KPIs in accordance and with guidance from your executive leadership. And it is critical, absolutely critical that you move away from a compliance oriented mindset to a security first mindset. Often we look at organizations that you know run simulations or exercises just once a year, uh, just because it ticks a checkbox. The right mindset to have over here is making sure you're thinking as your users are equal partners in uh, protecting your digital estate. And that's why security first mindset is critical. 
Next, you should go ahead and formulate the right program. You shouldn't really think about simulation as a single entity, but think about a holistic campaign that you're going to run and evolve over a period of time and which you design working with stakeholders like the learning and development teams, SOC teams, your HR partners, your executive partners, so that you can think of a long-term campaign to really drive change within uh, your organization. As you design this campaign, you should go ahead and define the right user segments you want to educate. Could be your uh, new users, could be your veteran employees, could be your executives. And based on that, you can design if you want to drive a targeted approach. Maybe you want to design a program separately for new hires and so on. Based on that user segment, then you work with partners like your SOC team to design the right category of content. Uh, so that it simulates real world attacks. Often we find that organizations may do something very basic, but it is important that you treat your SOC teams or partners as equal stakeholders and make sure that uh, you are mimicking real world attacks so that your end users are better trained and better, better educated. Once you have set up and formulated that entire experience, then you go ahead, test and iterate, you go ahead and roll out the program, and finally, you make sure you're continuously tracking some of these key metrics as you go about. We look at the case studies or what these key metrics could be, but this is an evolving exercise. This is a continuous exercise which you should do to make sure your organization is resilient. So with that uh, scope, let's look at one multinational company. So we have Raina, who is a director of security behavior. She has a dedicated role in Contos Intelligence, and she is responsible for driving resilience of uh, 100K plus uh, user base. So there is a very uh, uh, major emphasis on positive user behavior, on driving and refocusing, reinforcing that positive behavior with rewards, with badges, with gamified experiences in context of cybersecurity. So when they design their simulations, they do take uh, uh, a basic approach that they want to target employees twice or thrice in a calendar year but they do contextualize or slice and dice additional campaigns based on risk profiles or business needs for users. For example, if there are repeat offenders, there are additional trainings which are configured for them. If there are new employees, there is a basic IO security awareness program that is often learned for them. There are separate category of simulations which are run for high value employees. And for each of these, there is a lot more focus on customized payloads, customized notifications, and a lot, a lot of focus on positive reinforcement messages. The goal of guide is to learn and evolve rather than penalize. And that is where there is no uh, focus on negative emotions that you, know, you failed or we should escalate your manager. It's always rewarding or reinforcing positive behavior. And as they look about measuring some of the key metrics to uh, uh, judge the success of this program, they do track click reports, uh, click rates and compromise rates and how many employees report the fish message. But it is often the conjunction of a over a period of time, it's aggregate trends and individual user clicks or individual user details are never uh, clicked or never published. It's always an aggregate experience which is shared. So even though it's a large organization, they do focus on monthly simulations or regular simulations. They do make sure that they are tracking aggregate metrics with a focus on positive mindset and reinforcing positive behavior. So with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Richa, who's going to take us through the second case study and then how AST can help you with uh, cybersecurity awareness. Richa, over to you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Vipul. So we have another fa fascinating case study for you guys. Uh, it's from a multinational financial organization. And here our spokesperson is Peter, who is security education and awareness manager. Um, so he's responsible for the uh, making sure that 50,000 employees are resilient against cyber attacks and they know what's the right action to undertake in case uh, when they see a phishing uh, mail. So uh, one interesting fact for you guys, I mean, um, the report message rates for this organization that we are representing today has been consistently one of the highest amongst our customers. So uh, with that, I'll get into um, how they have designed the program. So starting with like how, what are the key metrics that they track? So as we have seen in the earlier case study, compromise and reporting rates again uh, come here as a key metrics and uh, they are also tracking the time to response. Time to response is essentially when you, uh, when the time when the message is first read to the first compromise um, event that they saw. So this is again something which is available in AST. We'll talk 
uh, about it later. And they also track uh, training completion status. So the program is designed um, in such a way that it simulates like 10% of the workforce on a monthly basis. And then uh, it ensures that at least each of the employee goes through at least two simulations annually. And additionally, uh, like how we have seen in the earlier case study, they also do tailored simulations for specific groups and business units, like uh, specific groups like repeat offenders or users who haven't been simulated before um, and such. So uh, Peter also design for, works on uh, customizing their content like payloads and uh, email notification landing pages to ensure that it's relevant across different business units and contexts. Uh, he utilizes a blend of training material which is there provided by Microsoft and also some of the self-developed training material to ensure that their end users get a holistic understanding of um, how they can meet the uh, how they can uh, mitigate the cyber threats. So um, as you can see, the program success isn't just based on execution, but it also lies in analysis. So Peter also regularly tracks some of the key trends like uh, across employee uh, grades, teams, location, their uh, time in the organization and uh, repeat offenders so that they can design like multiple uh, targeted interventions. We can go to the next slide, Vipul. So uh, let's look at how you can leverage attack simulation training to achieve your security goals. So something I should uh, reinstate, uh, it's available as part of MDO P2 plan or uh, M365 E5 offering. Um, so some of the things that you can uh, like starting right from the training material. So in AST, you can shift from using AST, you can shift from long form static content to interactive content, which is provided by our partners like SANS and Terranova. It, it's available in 35 plus languages. And uh, these trainings can be assigned independently of simulations. The second, you can use lightweight how to guides, which are interactive experiences within Outlook. So some of the content which is readily available is on how to identify, uh, is on reporting phishing simulation and also identifying and reporting QR code uh, phishing attempts. And uh, as we uh, have just learned from like two of the insightful case studies that how critical it is to think like an attacker. So therefore it's very important that you need the right content, uh, differentiated content, which fits your user's context. So you can use a variety of tools which are available in ASG today, like the rich text editor. You can design your own uh, payloads using that. Uh, we also harvest a library of payloads from real world attacks. So you can use those as is or customize those or um, you can use payload automation and MDO recommended payloads to uh, get um, a real attacks or uh, uh, payloads to get payloads from real attacks within um, from your tenant that are specific to your tenants. So we also have something called predicted compromise rate, which you can use in the payload editor to instantly get the compromise rate while you're authoring the payloads. Additionally, you can create um, more or edit uh, landing pages, login pages, all that content. Um, and last, uh, like while the credential harvest technique remains a popular simulation, technique in ASG, but it's essential to consider um, that attackers are not going to use the same approach. So that's why it's also important to think like an attacker and train your users in multiple techniques like OAuth, consent grant, malware attachment and uh, some more. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, now that you're almost set to launch uh, your simulation, you need to empower your users to report suspicious emails so you can integrate with Microsoft's report fish button and uh, through that you will be able to track the user behavior within the simulation reports. Um, and uh, um, lastly but not the least, we have learned from different case studies that report how critical it is to uh, uh, track the relevant metrics. So all those metrics you can get within uh, reporting and analytics like we have a lot of we have different types of uh, reports available, aggregate reports, user reports. So you can see all these telemetry on compromise rate, report rates, uh, message read, click, uh, and a lot of other things. So um, now that you have like um, seen the core capabilities of AST, it's very important that you, you are using your time wisely because uh, 
as we have seen, you need to interact with a lot of stakeholders to stay up updated with uh, what is the relevant content to design the right uh, uh, simulation programs and to get the feedback so you can save time with automations. So uh, using simulation automation, you can launch like uh, multiple simulations for multiple batches of users over extended period of times in one go. And uh, uh, with we have recently released AST's graph, right graph API. So now you can not only, um, I mean, just uh, get the data to create custom dashboards, but also you can use the right API to create your uh, um, different scenarios. And so that you can build custom automation scenarios or integrate with other security tools. So uh, moving on. Um, so here are some resources that you can check out later. Um, so this I I think this video will be available, so you'll be able to check out this um, all these resources later. And we are leaving uh, the last session of today uh, with some uh, food for thought for you. So hope you have enjoyed all the sessions today. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Richard Whipple and Daniel and Nathan. And now we are at the end of the uh, session or the event. So I've shared the track one link for you all. So you can join that track or that meeting and there we will be having the final ending quiz of this event. Thank you so much. Thank Anikhil. you everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.